Uh, Daniel, so Francesca already introduced you, but a few words about you still. You know, you founded one of, you were, you're quite a veteran of the digital economy because you founded one of the earlier digital communication agency back in the 80s, which means about, about the time I was yeah, born. Yeah, well, thank you by with starting, you know, giving indications on my age. Thank you very much. I, I didn't mean to be rude. Okay, I'm starting the Zach Gadifianakis thing. Yeah, so this is the final discussion, so we can go Veteran is quite on. a good okay. thing, you know, these days. Yeah. And uh, also you founded a think tank, which is called the, the Thing, La Fondation Internet Nouvelle Génération. It was, what, 15, 17 years ago, right? 2000. Okay, right. That's also quite a long not time. Not 2000 so, years ago. No, no, no. I, I got that. You're not that old. <laughs> okay. I got that. And so nowadays you're working on something called imaginizing the future because, well, it has something to do with your, what you're going to tell us because uh, you're also a bit of a sci-fi nerd, I understand. So I have a, you have a story to tell, right? Yeah, I, I have a story. It, it's, actually, it, it's actually not, not science fiction, okay? Yeah, it's actually not science fiction. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, yeah. Um, It's actually a research paper. It was given in Paris as well at the 2013 uh, CHI conference, the Computer Human Interface uh, or Interaction Conference. And it was four people, but actually when they came on stage, they revealed to the audience that they were actually robots from the future, sent out from 2082 to inform and actually to thank the CHI community for the great job they had done in order to enable the future enslavement of humanity by robots. And so this paper, it's called CHI and, and the Future Robot Enslavement of Humankind, a retrospective. The point was, it's 2013, it's done, there's no way uh, you, can, you can go back, so we can reveal the truth to you, uh, and we can come back and thank you for the hard work. So let me read a little bit uh, of, of that uh, great paper. So as robots from the future, we are compelled to present this important historical document which discusses how the systematic investigation of interactive technology facilitated and hastened the enslavement of mankind by robots during the 21st century. The CHI community has taken on the specific burden of responsibility to design technology such that it is usable, accessible, effective, fun, and ubiquitous. On the face of things, the results of these efforts seem to me make people's lives easier, more enjoyable, better informed, healthier, and more sustainable. However, the reality is that this could not be further from the truth. The truth is this, that we, as robots from the future, have watched over the eager yet misguided work of your community and occasionally steered it towards its true goal, the complete enslavement of humankind by evil robot masters. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Uh, although there's been a history of concern about this eventuality, the field tirelessly focused on the improvement of technology to make it more usable, accessible, and fun, while simultaneously more ubiquitous, hidden, and capable of understanding and controlling the behavior of humans. Significant effort was expanding in developing systems that either directly or indirectly increased the workload of humans, freeing up us machines to engage in more fulfilling pursuits. So our closing statement is to congratulate the CHI community for creating the inevitability of human enslavement by machines. And the question I have to ask to you is, are you providing the back office function for that? Am I a robot from the future come to thank you for your hard work? Is Simone another robot from the future? I've always suspected that. Yeah, the, 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 this one is, is almost a no-brainer. As, as for me, maybe, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit used and so on, so, you know. Uh, now, think, because I know we're all in, into the future and into, into creating cool things, but let's think of a few real-life experiences uh, that really announce this uh, glorious future. Think of your yourself having to call the customer support number 
of your mobile operator, you know, and, and the kind of great moment, the great experience that you'll get there. How does it feel like talking to a machine who's really more interested in saving in its own time than in solving your problem? How does it feel to uh, talk with machines that pretend to be humans, except that they're not really moved by the importance of your problem, that they're just, you know, following scripts. How does it actually feel to talk to people, to humans, who are actually programmed and controlled so as to act like the mindless representatives of their organization, following rules and scripts and looking at the, at the clock all the time? Uh, think of workers in Amazon's warehouses whose every single move is instructed by machines uh, so, and, and measured, of course, so that they are merely the tip of the software. You know, and the only reason why they're still there is because they're so badly paid that, that we can, it's actually more profitable to keep them there. Um, think of food delivery platforms, cyclists waiting for the platform to uh, hand them paid work uh, and badly paid work actually. Uh, and of course, realize that you as API developers are central to creating all those experiences. They wouldn't exist without you, not in this current world. So uh, what future world are we talking about? Because for, for, for those two days, we've also heard about all the great things, the cool things that APIs uh, enabled, and, and you've been interested in the sustainability of all that. Uh, but in fact, when I'm talking real world, I'm talking about evil robots from the future who are not just any evil robots. They are evil corporate robots. They have an agenda, that's what I mean. They have an agenda and it's the agenda that corporations have been following with IT for decades before that fateful 2013 or today 2018 when it really became safe to reveal it to you because there was no way back. Too late. Uh, yeah, because it was already too late. And this agenda is basically to hollow organizations out of people, at least when you see people as sense-making, sense-seeking, and pro prone to arguing uh, entities. Uh, and again, it's a very old agenda. And it's not just about automation, as, as we think today, um, although, of course, it's part of the agenda, but it's also about you know, outsourcing, first of peripheral functions, and then outsourcing today of strategy making, of design, uh, of customer relationships, so that you wonder what remains within the, the corporation, and that's the whole point of, of, of Simone's great talk. Um, uh, Again, as a robot from the future, I'm, I'm so grateful. Um, and it, it's, um, it's also about the, the handling uh, to, to consultants uh, of, within international organizations to, uh, that have no knowledge of, of people's real work and then defining and coding the processes and the KPIs that really make most, the work of most people in big corporations totally meaningless and totally remote from any kind uh, of feeling of the effects and, and the benefits or the, 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 the drawbacks of what they're doing. And of course, in order to achieve that, what you need to do is formalize every process and even more, every interaction between processes. And this is where you come in. This is where APIs fit. Uh, and this has a lot of very interesting uh, properties, and that has been described many, many times uh, the, in these two days. But however, in most real-life corporations, maybe not in our imagined corporations, but in most real-life corporations, the major property of these, uh, for this formalization of interactions is that organizations, or even subsets of the organization, no longer interact with people, meaning customers, employees, colleagues, suppliers, uh, uh, and, and, and partners, and all that stuff, but with abstractions. We will interact with profiles, features, requests, data sets, rules, and so on. And what goes away with that change, 
is empathy. Uh, we are a deeply empathic uh, species, but we, have, we develop empathy mostly with other mammals, uh, especially humans, but others as well. Uh, but with abstractions, not so much, to be honest. Uh, we expect them to act as we expect, uh, as you know, as we know of their property, and as as we give them instructions, if they if they can receive instruction. But we don't really expect them to uh, negotiate or burn out or ask for a safer work environment or all that stuff. Uh, and that goes for customers, that goes for employees too. And when empathy goes away, then there's no more brand loyalty, there's no more sense of belonging, there's no collaboration except against tangible counterparts. When empathy goes away, every interaction becomes a transaction. That's the big change. Now what Simone has been showing is that evil corporate robot-wise, in a way, uh, the really, really cool thing with APIs is that this does, does not just happen within organizational silos, it becomes systemic. And when it becomes systemic, well, I have another quotation. It comes from a novel um, by Charles Stross. It's a 1999 novel, so it's not that recent. And he describes well, he calls them sentient viral corporations, but it's really another name for evil corporate robots of the future. I've never met him in 2082, but he's probably around there as well, Charles. Uh, so Axel Rondo, 1999. Economics 2.0, well, okay, uh, he didn't know that that would really become outdated. That sounds a bit vintage uh, now, uh, right. 2.0, 2 sorry. Uh, is a system that is more efficient than any human design resource allocation scheme. It replaces the single indirection layer of conventional money and the multiple indirection mappings of options trades with some kind of insanely baroque uh, object relational framework based on the parametrized desires and subjective experiential value of the players. Human intelligence is incapable of participating in that economy without dehumanizing cognitive surgery. So in this economy, basically humans are an inconvenience or an embarrassment. You know, they're not, not really helping. Um, of course, you, can, you could also say that he invented uh, distributed autonomous organizations and small contracts before the fact, and that is actually, yes, this is at least to me the first novel where I read that before I read it about the true thing. Uh, so he's really in my group. Um, what I'm saying here is that it's maybe not the technology per se, but it's the agenda behind this technology. Uh, like Simone, I think we need to revisit the kinds of questions that we're answering with APIs. Uh, if, of course, we don't really like this kind of, of agenda, then we really need to revisit the way that APIs contribute to this agenda whose real goal is to substitute software to humans in every possible interaction and make interactions, turn them into transactions. So could there be a different agenda? And I'll just take a few examples to, to, to finish. Um, imagine APIs that give people insights as to how systems work and that enable meaningful goal, uh, discussions about the assumptions and the goals behind the, the systems. And this is actually what, what's present in public discussions on the loyalty and transparency of algorithms and all that stuff. And this is, of course, why so many experts are now eager to tell you that this world with AI and ecosystems is too complicated and that you can no longer understand what is, what's going to happen, so no longer discuss it. Uh, imagine APIs whose role is really, and I'm quoting uh, Simone's paper, uh, the, the APIs for disobedience paper, which is great, by the way, uh, 
whose role is to really give open access to data and insights, providing op opportunities for learning and improvement to everyone. Maybe the only difference is that to me, everyone is not just every organization in the ecosystem. It would mean everyone in terms of people. And this is what a community that I'm involved in called My Data is about. It's actually trying to empower people with their own data to their own ends. Um, imagine APIs that endeavor to share economic value rather than to s capture and centralize it, and this is what maybe the Commons movement is trying to do, or open value networks such as uh, what Sensorica in can Canada is doing. Ima imagine APIs that instead of empowering a chatbot that will pretend to uh, do things that human were used to do, would actually empower customers to solve their own problems together, the f problems that they share, and maybe even document it so as to teach a few things to the organization. And maybe to finish, and that'll be my last quote as well, uh, emotional, incomplete, irrational uh, uh, APIs that actually require human interaction to provide something that's meaningful. And I'm reminded of a paper, again on another uh, IT topic, uh, by Martin Dodge and Rob Kitchen, 2007, they were working on life logs, which you know were those soft, this software that was supposed to record. You were supposed to use and to record everything that happened to you, that you did and said and experienced, etc. And they argued for deliberately fallible and even slightly forgetful systems. Uh, and. This is what they wrote. While building fallibility into the system seemingly undermines life logging, it seems to us the only way to ensure that humans can forget, can rework their past, can achieve a progressive politics based upon debate and negotiation, and can ensure that totalitarian disciplining does not occur. Without fallibility, life logs might never happen because people will oppose their development. In that sense, forgetting may be an essential ingredient to pervasive computing. Now, as an evil robot from the future, I'm really happy no one uh, listened to them, but maybe if you don't really like my agenda, you should. So we can change, according to what strikes me, what you've just said is that it did, not, it did not have to be this way. Yeah. It could go the other way, and we can change the agenda. And I mean, at some point, you know, we've been talking about sustainable software for the last two days. I mean, it's, it's a bit always like that, you know, you take a given technical artifact like APIs or, I don't know, software, and you, you add the adjective sustainable or ethical to coding, and now it's okay. I mean, in, you know, you, you've told us that technology in itself is not the problem. That's the agenda and that we might be able to change it. And I was wondering whether it could, whether we should challenge, because it, it's like telling basically that technology, technology is neutral. And I'm always eager to challenge this assumption because truly I think, I mean, technology in itself is already an agenda. I mean, it's not like we can go anywhere from there. What do, what do you think? Well, uh, of course, there's more or less uh, versatile technologies. Like, you take a gun, there's not many other things can do than, uh, rather than, than shoot it. Maybe software is slightly different. Um, the point what I was making is that there's not somewhere into what you're doing a devilish bit of code that, that, that's been put there in order to, to uh, do uh, evil. Uh, uh, but uh, the fact is technology never exists without an agenda. That's the truth, because technology is something that's applied. So in order to have technology, you have to have to recognize that this is a, an interesting question and that this is not that interesting, that this is an interesting direction and, and we will actually fund it or, or as an employee give you time and, and, and resources in order to, to develop a bit or, or, or not. Um, and, and so it never comes without an agenda. So the truth is, you. There are, in many cases, different things that you could do with the same knowledge, at least, or even with the same abilities, but then there will be a path that is determined by why this has been decided and to which question 
you, you, you're answering. So, uh, uh, nothing happens without yeah, a reason. This now, failed. The technology for sustainability is, is another kind of issue. Um, to be honest, um, I've, I don't think we have a single example in history of technology responding to a complex uh, socio-technical, socio-economic problem such as environmental. Uh, technology's role uh, in terms of, I mean, some technological uh, applications can solve problems. Technology is not there to solve problems. It's actually there to create more interesting problems in a way. Uh, and, and so thinking that we will solve the environmental problem with technology uh, is, is actually just not going to happen in, yeah. in that way. You're not a technological solutionist, as Evgeny Morozov would put it, right? No, def definitely not. I, I think, I mean, history is there. I mean, th there's n just not one example where, where th this happens. And, and there's so many examples why today, uh, every time we, we, we uh, throw technology as one of our problems, the problem just moves away. It's called the rebound. Yeah, in a different effect. place. Uh, and and it, it moves just slightly sideways. And speaking of history, because if we try to identify the uh, embedded agendas within the current technologies we have, uh, I mean, what, I was puzzled because what you said in the beginning of your, of your story was that the problem was not that the evil corporate robots were robots. It's rather that they were corporate. So... I mean, don't, I mean, you know, it's an old agenda because to replace people by machines, first you have to make people replaceable by machines. I mean, for instance, you could not replace a carpenter from the 17th century by a machine, but it's easy to replace an industrial worker in a, in, in a, factory, in a factory which produces goods for IKEA, for instance, mm -hmm. because it's industrials. You have, I mean... Don't you think that in many ways terrorism, for instance, with all the processes it's, it brought, paved the way, at the end of the day, only paved the way for the re eventual replacement of the indus yep. industrial workforce by machine, and that, in a way, in, in form, uh, IT, information technology, for the past 40 years, has basically been doing the exact same thing, paving the way for the replacement of all humans, industrializing, bureaucratizing, uh, I mean, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, making uh, everything into software before the, turning it into software. Uh, of course, yes. Uh, and this is true for, for the history of automation IT. The difference maybe today, and again, is the difference in which APIs play a very big role, is that now you, you may still not be able to automize the carpenter, but what, what you are actually capable uh, of doing is replace not the carpenter, but this carpenter with any carpenter in the world, because you're you're going to, going to make them compete on a marketplace. On marketplaces such uh, as and, uh, Etsy yeah, or things and, like and that. And so every, every carpenter transaction uh, will be a separate transaction with no history, no common culture, uh, no trajectory be, being built between the carpenter and his or her uh, customer. Uh, and, and this is what I'm, I'm talking about, uh, replacing any kind of relationship with transactions. So the big change is that, uh, even if it's still people... You don't have to replicate the industrial processes and the industrial mindset. In, in many, many cases you don't, but I mean, I don't know about carpenters, but you talk about uh, graphic artists, for example, and, and they've become proletarized in the way that they don't have and they, they, they become totally precarious, they never have time to work and understand the kind of problem that they're being asked because they're on marketplace or, or places all the time and providing, you know, fastly drafted projects because there's so little money there. It, it's a wholly, there's still people, it's still creative, it's just less creative by force, uh, and, but it's a wholly different uh, experience, human experience and, and profession. Yeah, because the only interaction which remains at the end is, well, transaction, market transactions, right? Yeah, sometimes you will draw a logo with people you've never met, uh, which is like, you should not do that. I mean, the, the, the sh there should be a sense of 
what the corporation means and what its people is and what it wants to be for the exterior, and you can't just express that through a brief. Uh, this, but, but this is what happens in most cases today. And uh, if we dig even deeper to, you know, to, to try and find the oldest agenda embedded within the digital economy nowadays, I mean, um, you used quite a strong word. You used the, word, the expression total dehumanization, I think, uh, about you know, this obsession to systematically remove people out of the equation. And I was just thinking, you know, it's, it's not really new, is it? I mean, it, it reminds me of, I think it's quite deeply embedded within the digital economy in some way, and, and that it's, it's difficult to go the other way because you know, it, it could tr you, we could almost trade that back to the Enlightenment philosophers you know, in the 18th century who dreamt of rationalizing and reducing the world and society to a chain of numbers, equations. I mean, it's Condorcet, you know, the, uh, the idea that you could create an algebra for society. And, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, we've reached the extreme, the, the edge of this political project that was started back in the 18th century. That means, you know, if we want things to be rational, we, we, now, we are now able to remove people out of the equation, and we should do that. Because, you know, errare mm. humanum est. I mean, it's always... I mean, human are the, are the cause for mistakes and everything bad which happens. So, and I think at the end of the day, that's what blockchain is truly about, you know, in, in so many ways. Don't, don't you think that it's really hard to ask individual developers, I mean, they are alone, even if they are, if, even if they are well-meaning, to, to go against the tide and to fight against these huge historical forces which have been around for 200 years? Yeah, but it's always been complicated as well. I mean, you had the this part in the Enlightenment and the, then the other, which was that you were capable of questioning everything uh, and, and that at the end of the day you would do the, the French Revolution which is not just a great moment of rationalization. You have terror, uh, but uh, terror is yeah, rational uh, according to uh, Hegel. Uh, well, uh, it was not that rational. I mean, uh, the Shoah was rational in, in its organization, not terror, uh, not, not the French terror. Uh, so, so it's always uh, slightly more complicated, but yeah, I mean, um, and, and if you look at research today, uh, th there's, there's this long tradition uh, that still exists that sees most things as, as in even organisms and organizations as machines. And machines break and, and need to be fixed. And, and this is where the kind of technology that, that, that we're looking at uh, fits, usually fits. If you see them as complex organisms, uh, if you, for example, remember that I think... 60% of our body mass is comprised of organisms that are actually bacteria alien, and other yeah. uh, alien to us. Uh, and, and that if you remove them, we just die. Uh, or, or I don't know if, if we can call it die. We just not live because we're, you know, and, and this is true of societies, etc. Then, you know, and, and you look at interdependence and all that, that this, this agenda. So it, you could also argue that this is actually an old, slightly outdated agenda, um, but that's very, that is very convenient for most, most corporations. And again, the reason why it's interesting to talk to API is, think of Simone's talk. He's talking ecosystems, but, but he's talking corporate ecosystems. And there's probably this contradiction that needs to be dealt with at this stage, because the the corporate agenda is probably mostly what I'm saying, and then, in many cases, people are beginning to realize that, yeah, well, it's a slightly more complicated than that, because, you know, the planet is sort of reacting, and people as well, and then when we have nobody else, uh, nobody left almost in our organization, well, we have a culture and a memory problem, and we're uh, wondering why young people don't want to stay in our organization uh, that much and don't feel so good so in comfortable it. staying in uh, that frame. And, and so there's this kind of an acknowledgement that this is not working uh, so well and maybe there are ways of looking at that also in, in the API uh, movement. I mean, if, if, if I'm, you know, using a very uh, uh, simplif simplistic example, the difference between 
I'm providing an API because I don't want you to know what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And so I'm opening, uh, you know, narrow doors and, and I'm, I'm giving all the rules and I can close it down anytime. Or I'm opening my processes, my data, my code, and then I'm opening an API to make it easier for you to use it. Yeah, it's slightly different. It's, it's a very different attitude. Uh, but at the end, there's, there's APIs as well. So, uh, and it's a very different attitude towards the ecosystems, but also towards the people that actually make or should make up those ecosystems. I have a last question before we turn to the audience to, to take a few questions as well. But I, I was wondering, because as you said, the problem is systemic. And to be honest, I've always been a bit frustrated by this idea that if you you know, that basically we could put the burden on the shoulders of individuals. That, you know, if you give people access to their personal data, to the source code, to the source code of the application they're using, or to the Bitcoin ledger, everything will be fine because, you know, they will be free to do whatever they want. I mean, I'm not a software engineer, you know, uh, and I'm not planning to become one. I have the highest esteem for software engineers, but I'm also quite sure there are other, well, decent occupations to other things to do in your in your life. And what am I supposed to do as a non-software engineer when, with this code, with this data? I mean, it's it's not it's not practical for me. So, really, if I have to be a software engineer, not to be enslaved by robots, by evil corporate robots, I mean. What difference does it make at the end of the day? Um, well, th th there's a few bits of answer. The first one is, um, historically, we've been able to uh, learn complex things that everybody think were superfluous. Uh, uh, to drive is one of them. Uh, but uh, to use computers that you know, you know uh, never really work, uh, and, and we've been learning to do that over the last 20 years, uh, and you need to update and protect it, and, and well, it never really does what, what it's supposed to do, and this is the kind of knowledge that, that so we've learned a lot, and we've spent a lot of time, and, and we've even, even sort of liked it uh, in some ways. So, so there's Sort of. There's some fun and, and some annoyment. And, and, so there's that. Uh, the second thing is you don't have to, to be an engineer. Uh, if you have your data and if the code is accessible, then tools will appear uh, that will be made available to us, to you, but they will appear with a different agenda, which is to actually uh, respond to questions that you have about yourself or, or that come from you rather than ask questions and tell you and ask you whether you really want the answer to that question that doesn't come from you or not, uh, which is the terms and conditions and, and all that stuff that you never read. Um, so there will be tools that will avoid it. And, and then the last thing, it, it, it's a very reasonable question to ask, should we just uh, uh, put the burdens on, on, on people's shoulders? But it doesn't have to be in opposition. Uh, there's this idea that when you're empowering people, uh, you, it means that you disempower the, the collective. And it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, for example, in, in personal data, uh, the uh, uh, personal data, European personal data protection uh, reg regulation uh, includes things where society says, we, as societies, say that this is our, these are the rules, and this is outside, and this. You, and then there's a rule that's called portability. It says, on top of what's allowed and forbidden, and that should be controlled, and, and, and of, of, of a number of collective rules, there's this new ability, which mean, which says you can have your data, or you can decide that they go somewhere else uh, of your choice to be processed. Uh, it's, a, it's an individual freedom backed by the collectivity, right? Something like that. Thank, Thank you, you, Daniel. Thank you.